Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Today we're telling a story of siblings born and bred to run the world. They were the most infamous family of the 20th century. Their story drips with conspiracy. Their names whispered through the decades since they left their voices echoing in time and space. Their hands helped mold the America we know, sharing with their country dreams of landing on the moon, freedom for every man. And by example, they inspired generations to reach the highest heights. They played with fire, and only a few survived. Their words ring through our history books, their pretty faces on our television screens, and their signature will forever be stamped on our national identity. They stood in the trenches. We stood beside them. They flashed their diamonds. We flashed our cameras. They had their fun, and we saluted them. They were good, they were evil, they were human. They are the Kennedy siblings. Once Jack had won the election, Bobby's first priority automatically switched from helping his brother win the election to helping his brother succeed as president. Jack is now the president-elect. We're in this two-month period where he knows he's going to be president, but has not taken office yet. Correct. And Abraham Rubikoff, governor of Connecticut at the time, said this to Jack. I have now watched you Kennedy brothers for five solid years now, and I notice that every time you face a crisis, you automatically turn to Bobby. You're out of the same womb. There's an empathy. You understand one another. You're not going to be able to be president without using Bobby all the time. Jack immediately agreed. To the point that, later, when Jack needed people or even other countries to take him seriously, he would send Bobby as the messenger. That was when you knew the president of the United States was serious, when his little brother was looking you in the face. So everyone knew it was obvious. Jack needed Bobby. The only question initially was where to put him. In what position would Bobby be the most helpful? They thought about making him the Undersecretary of Defense or an Assistant Secretary of State, but everyone could see that that would not end well. That would make the cabinet officer's boss and second-in-command boss brothers. Too much Kennedy. So then some people said, okay, just stick him right underneath the president and he can work closely with Jack, but then not really be anybody else's boss per se. Bobby said... Absolutely not. Immediately, no. Quote, That would be impossible, Bobby told Schlesinger. I had to do something on my own or have my own area of responsibility. I had to be apart from what he was doing, so I wasn't working directly for him and getting orders from him as to what I should do that day. That wouldn't be possible. So I never considered working at the White House. I love that Bobby was so self-aware, But I wonder how much they fought, like, with the Reeling brothers. They said that behind closed doors, full-on warfare. All bets were off. Yeah. But to the public, they were like a united front, Uh never argued or bickered or anything. And then with the Kardashians, we obviously have seen full-on physical fistfights. So So they decided to make him the attorney general. Beth, what exactly is the attorney general? According to USA.gov, The attorney general is the top legal officer, and they advise and represent their legislature and act as the people's lawyer for the citizens. So every state has one, and then there's one over the whole country. That was Bobby. At first, Bobby had decided not to take the job. It was December 1960, the month after the election, and he knew it was going to kill their dad if he declined, but it was a lot, and he wasn't sure he was fully qualified, so he would just have to be honest and let him down easy, which he could handle. What he could not handle was Jack. 
Bobby called him up to let him know that he didn't want the job. And Jack refused to talk about it on the phone. (laughs) I can just see the manipulative gears turning in Jack's mind as he's talking to Bobby, trying to figure out how he can turn this around. Which reminds me of when Kick was trying to get Jack to come visit her in England and told him the political scene was getting crazy. So he should come report. And she also lined up a few girls. Just for good measure. Jack asked Bobby to breakfast the next morning to discuss it. Obviously, this would give him time to put a game plan together, figure out what exactly he needs to say. And how many kids do Bobby and Ethel have at this point? Seven. Oh my gosh. I still see Bobby as like just graduating Mm -hmm, college or just- Two, maybe three kids. No, Bobby has been here and there and everywhere. And actually, there are several qualifications that he did have for attorney general. So we are going to talk about those in the KFM because one of Bobby's jobs that he had had previously is a very red string connection to one Judith Campbell Exner through the mafia. (laughs) So it's a lot. John described the meeting as basically Jack pleading with Bobby, completely insistent that he needed him. Quote, he said he needed someone around that would give him the unvarnished truth no matter what. Bobby later reported. So what do you think happened next? Bobby Kennedy was the new attorney general. He thought it would be important to him and that he needed some people around that he could talk to. So I decided to accept it. Bobby Kennedy. Bobby wasn't a pushover with anyone but Jack and maybe Ethel. (laughs) Honestly. Jack told him to go comb his hair. And then as they walked outside from the breakfast meeting, Jack told him, Bobby, don't smile too much or they'll think we're happy about the appointment. (laughs) You know you're a freaking mess if disheveled Jack is telling you to clean up. Bobby said later that Jack told him this story that some morning, I'm not exactly sure when in the timeline, but it was around 2 a.m. And Jack really wanted to announce that Bobby was going to be his attorney general. He knew he couldn't announce it yet, but it was eating him alive, keeping the news inside. So at two in the morning, he got out of bed, went and opened the front door, looked up and down the street just to make sure that no one was actually outside, and then whisper screamed into the night, it's Bobby. (laughs) There's also a letter from Bobby to Drew Pearson written on December 15th of 1960 that says, I made up my mind today and Jack and I will take the punch tomorrow. For many reasons, I believe it was the only thing I could do. I shall do my best and hope that it turns out well. Sounds so precious, right? Mm -hmm. Well, some people think that maybe most of this was for show. To discourage critics from thinking that they were just putting Bobby in this position because he wanted to be the attorney general or accusations of Jack just hiring his brother to a position of such power because he could. Allegedly, that letter from Bobby that I just read may have been written the day before Jack and Bobby allegedly had their meeting and may have been written the day before Jack supposedly talked Bobby into taking the job at breakfast. (laughs) That maybe... That was why the Nashville reporter was allowed into the decision-making meeting. Maybe the decision was already made. And when Ethel, Bobby's wife, met them at the West Palm Beach airport after Jack and Bobby had announced that he was taking the position, she allegedly flashed a big smile and shouted in the airport, We did it! So you're telling me that Jack and Bobby sat down together, scripted out this entire conversation, and then literally played it out in front of this one person. Yeah, for one person. A reporter. Hey, I don't put it past them, though. It tracks. The Kennedys thought that Bobby's successful performance of the job would dissipate any criticism about him being appointed to attorney general. So once he was in the position, people would see it was the right decision. But again, like many of the Kennedys' predictions... This did not happen. Journalists and legal experts across the board were skeptical and pointed out that Bobby's experience gave him absolutely no claim to this position. So, in this episode's KFM, KFM 15, we are going to take a look at Bobby's qualifications, which 
may or may not have several other of our story's characters involved. This is where our episodes collide, where Frank, Peter, and Pat's world collides with Bobby and Jack's world. This is when he and Jack led the case against corruption in labor unions and fought against Jimmy Hoffa and a man named Sam Giancana, who sometimes also went by Sam Flood. And all of the rumors about Jack getting votes and support from the mafia, we shall discuss it all. For now, just know that Bobby was more than capable. But at first, even Jack didn't think he wanted Bobby working for him. Back when Jack was first running for Congress, Bobby was so excited to help his big brother. His Harvard friend, Kenny O'Donnell, remembered, quote, I didn't realize how Bobby worshipped him, could not stop talking about him. I think it was the first time Jack paid any attention to him. Jack was less than enthusiastic about having Bobby helping with the campaign, as he thought that Bobby's serious demeanor would do more harm than good. Jerk. (laughs) Okay, just to keep the timeline clear, how old were they? This is back in 1947 when Jack was first running for the House of Representatives. So Jack was 30 and Bobby was 22. Jack told his friend Red Faye, you know, the jabbing the needle in the leg story, that Red Faye, quote, It's damned nice of Bobby wanting to help, but I can't see that sober, silent face breathing new vigor into the ranks. Jack's plan was to take a photo or two to show the press that Bobby, little brother, was there to help. And then he asked Red Faye to get him out of there as soon as possible. Quote, One picture of the two brothers together will show, we're all in this for Jack. Then you take Bobby out to the movies or whatever you want to do. Allegedly, Red Faye had a wonderful time. (laughs) Could not stop laughing through the whole movie. But Bobby, Red Faye said, From his expression, he might have been paying last respects to his closest friend. (laughs) This is why Jack always called him Black Robert. (laughs) Next, it was Lem's turn to babysit. He chose to send Bobby off into political enemy territory to knock on doors, just cold calling in places they knew were not blue. Guess what Bobby did? Instead of knocking on doors, he joined in the neighborhood kids softball game. And by being the same Bobby in 1947, as he would be in 1967, he won votes in a place the Kennedy campaign had deemed a dead zone. It had the effect that the Kennedys weren't snobs, remembered a local. What happened in 1967? Your favorite story. Every story is my favorite story. (laughs) Well, this one took place on Tuesday afternoon in April 1967. There was a big sibling set playing out in front of their house when suddenly they noticed a crowd of people walking up the street, which was shocking. They lived in the rural delta of the Mississippi River, and none of them had ever seen something like that happen. So they all stood still and stared, and I can just imagine the ball just like bouncing, and they're all just waiting to see what would happen. Suddenly, a man in the suit broke away from the crowd and walked right up to one of the kids and offered his hand. This was astonishing because the kid... Dillard was black, and the man was white. He introduced himself as Robert Kennedy. That didn't mean much to Dillard. (laughs) He didn't have a TV, but... He was the first white person I ever shook hands with, Dillard recalled. And that did mean something. Bobby spoke quietly, asking Dillard why he wasn't in school. After he explained that he didn't go to school, Bobby, looking distressed, asked what he had eaten that day. Molasses, Dillard replied. As he prepared to leave, Bobby touched the kids' heads and gently caressed their cheeks. Quote, It wasn't like a politician kissing babies, said Ellen Meacham. He touched those children as if they were his own. His longtime aide, Peter Edelman, recalled, I remember he came out of one of those houses and he was just, he couldn't believe it. 
He told me this was the worst poverty he had ever seen, worse than anything he'd ever seen in a third world country. He couldn't stop thinking of those hungry kids, those children in rags with swollen bellies and running sores on their arms and legs that wouldn't heal. It was horrific. Just a few hours later, Bobby arrived back home in Hickory Hill. It was Ethel's birthday, and she and the kids had stayed up late to welcome him back. But as Bobby walked into his very comfortable home and saw his 10 children, all dressed in clothes that fit them, all smiling brightly with healthy skin, chubby cheeks, sparkling eyes, and curls in their hair, he stopped dead in his tracks. Earlier that same day, he had been in Mississippi, and the contrast between the two images, both of innocent children, but in two very different situations, was a lot. Quote, He looked haunted and started talking to me, shaking his head in distress as he described the people he'd met in the Delta. Kathleen, not Kick, Kennedy Townsend, his oldest daughter. I was with a family who live in a shack the size of this dining room, he told me. The children's stomachs were distended and they had sores all over them. They were starving. He was outraged that this could happen in the world's richest country. And I just looked up how old Kathleen, not Kick Kennedy, would have been at this point. And she was about 16 years old. So she probably has a pretty good, vivid memory of this. Especially because Bobby slammed his fist on the table and looked around at his children, who were certainly stunned. Do you know how lucky you are? Do you know how lucky you are? You have a great responsibility. Do something for these children. Do something for our country. According to Holly Bailey, Bobby had stood on top of a car, speaking to the people of Clarksdale, vowing he would not forget the people of the Mississippi Delta. And he didn't. Dillard recalled that within hours of Bobby's visit, a bunch of food showed up at his grandparents' house where he and his siblings were staying along with several cousins. The morning after he arrived back in Washington, Bobby began lobbying the agriculture department to get additional food aid into the Delta, a push that federal officers initially resisted. Quote, I think what he always did have was compassion for other people who had problems. I think part of this was that he did not find anything easy. Things did not come easy to him. So he was very sympathetic to other people who did not have it easy. I think what he never had was a compassion for wealth that was not used properly by the privileged. He had very little compassion for that. David Hackett, Bobby's Lem Billings. This right here is why Rose and Bobby had a special bond. They were the most Catholic. This next conversation sounds so much like us. Okay, Beth, I'm Bobby and you're Jack. (laughs) Jack, joking with friends. I just wanted to give him a little legal practice before he becomes a lawyer. Bobby later. Jack, you shouldn't have said that about me. Jack. Bobby, you don't understand. You've got to make fun of yourself in politics. Bobby. You weren't making fun of yourself. You were making fun of me. (laughs) The next thing on the horizon was the inaugural speech. Jack went to Florida on holiday prep to get a nice glowing tan. You know the thing he was most concerned about was how he was going to appear. Not only in person, but also for the camera. He was really worried about continuing to take his cortisone pills because it made him look very puffy and swollen in the face. Cortisone cream. Cortisone cream. (laughs) Patrons, if you know, you know. Jack even told his personal secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, quote, Oh my God, look at that fat face. If I don't lose five pounds this week, we might have to call off the inauguration. She said that he was pacing his room while dictating a letter. She was typing for him and he caught himself in the mirror and that she was laughing so hard she could hardly contain herself. (laughs) When Cassie first read me that quote, I thought it was kind of weird. Like, what the heck? Or that he was just being dramatic or like a prima donna. Yeah, or being stupid, just Mm -hmm. like trying to get a laugh. Yeah. But if you think about it, he was so dramatically skinny and like malnourished before because he was so sick. And then once he started taking the cortisone shots, it really did puff him up. And like I said, in one of the KFMs previously, he looked like a completely different Mm -hmm. person from like 1955 to 1960. Yeah. So it makes sense. 
he basically didn't even recognize himself. But in reality, his thick brown hair and his tan from his Florida vacation made him look like the picture of health. He was just so used to looking unhealthy (laughs) that he's like, what's going on? Who's this? (laughs) Again, similar to the presidential debate with Nixon, he looked completely calm and confident during his inauguration speech. He appeared unfazed, not worried at all about the responsibility he was about to take on. Like, he was born for this, and America had just been waiting for the rightful king to take his place all this time. And now, he had arrived. Evelyn Lincoln said, He looks like someone in whom we can have confidence. A Washington columnist wrote that he exuded grace under pressure. He is one of the handsomest men in American political life. He was born rich and has been lucky. He has conquered serious illness. He is as graceful as a greyhound and can be beguiling as a sunny day. Especially compared to the weather that hung over him. It was frigid that day. Washington, D.C. had gotten eight inches of fresh snow that morning. Undiscouraged, 20,000 American citizens gathered at the Capitol to witness the dawn of the 60s. Jack even made sure to bundle up with thermal underwear so that he could take off his overcoat in front of everyone and further exaggerate the JFK effect. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, he said from the podium. Writer Richard Reeves said this about Jack. Kennedy understood something that is not so obvious, and that is that words are more important than deeds. You can't govern 300 million people, or 180 million when Kennedy was president, by doing things. You can only do it by rhetoric. Jackie had just given birth to their son, John F. Kennedy Jr., whom I was going to call John John as the country affectionately nicknamed him, but apparently he actually hated being called that, so I won't. (laughs) Jackie had a pretty rough birth with him just two weeks after Jack was elected and less than two months before the inauguration, but she sported a dazzling smile and a glowing white gown at Jack's side, along with their entire family on the platform that day, of course. Minus Lee and Stosh, however, Jack and Jackie were sad to miss them. Remember from the Bouvier episodes, they were in England with baby Tina and couldn't travel. Couldn't, shouldn't, or wouldn't. (laughs) Touche. Probably the latter because this was when Lee was losing her mind, remember? Oh, I remember. Jackie became the first lady and Lee became the worst lady. (laughs) Back in Washington at the Kennedy inauguration, Robert Frost read a poem, and JFK asked Marian Anderson, a Black woman from Pennsylvania, to sing the Star-Spangled Banner as a symbol of forward movement in civil rights. Which she actually comes up in our mini so that we just posted on Patreon, The Roosevelt's and the Kennedys, Part 2. Kennedy's speech was one of the two most memorable inaugural addresses of the 20th century. Some of you may know it. Many of you. Most of you, I think. <laughs> He started by declaring a celebration of freedom. Quote, Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to ensure the survival of success and liberty. And to the developing nations, for whom he dedicated his first act as president, foreshadowing the Peace Corps, quote, Struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, he pledged our best efforts to help them help themselves for whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. Let both sides seek to invoke the wonders of science instead of its terrors. He had nuclear war hanging over his head. Let both sides unite to heed in all corners of the earth the command of Isaiah to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free. Ooh, calling back to KFM 10, the conspiracy of all conspiracies. All this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in the life of this administration nor even perhaps in our time on this planet. 
but let us begin. To borrow the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, Perhaps for ambitious personal reasons, as people say, but I'd rather think, because he really is interested in helping the people of his own country and mankind in general. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. I'm important, but not that important. Selfish, selflessness. It's the sphere. It's the Kennedy way. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service around the globe. Including his brother's grave and the men he fought alongside. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though embattled we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. He's quoting Isaiah again there. He lived this, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Mm -hmm. He lived that. A struggle against the common enemies of man. Tyranny poverty, disease, and war itself. He was willing to challenge people, and I think each one of us wants to be challenged. We want to think that our life has a mission, and he understood that and reached out to it. Kathleen, not kick, Kennedy Townsend. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history, the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. That is so good. Mm -hmm. After Jack's speech, three out of four Americans approved of their new president. As Eisenhower handed off the baton, he was the oldest president to have ever served in office until that point. And as Jack took the torch, he was the youngest American president to ever take office. Reagan, Trump, and Biden are the only presidents to have been older than Eisenhower while still in office, and JFK remains the youngest president to ever serve the U.S. at 43 years old. JFK was also the first president in American history to start weekly broadcasts live on television and radio as a conference or like town hall meeting with American citizens. His very own KFM. (laughs) His very own KFM. And he believed it really made a difference. A lot of experts strongly discouraged him from this idea at the time because they were worried that someone, Jack, may stick his foot in his mouth on live television. And one columnist named James Rustin even stated that it was, quote, the goofiest idea since the hula hoop and would end in a catastrophe. But Jack believed that the direct communication with the American people made the risk well worth it. Also, he got to show off his tan and his charm and his wit. I'm sure that didn't hurt either. (laughs) Jack took full ownership of his presidency. He tended not to follow arbitrary rules like sticking to your party and appointed anyone he respected to roles of leadership. He chose Republicans to head the Department of State, Treasury, Defense, and the CIA. When people complained, Jack just smiled and waved. I also had... Absolutely no idea, but Bethany, you said that you knew, but JFK started the freaking Peace Corps. If you're not familiar with it, it's not the military. Beth, do you want to explain? She actually almost enlisted a couple of years back. I decided to stick with rhetoric. (laughs) According to the JFK Library, on October 14th, 1960, at 2 a.m., Senator John F. Kennedy spoke to a crowd of 10,000 cheering students at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Kennedy asked, How many of you who are going to be doctors are willing to spend your days in Ghana? Technicians or engineers, how many of you are willing to work in the Foreign Service and spend your lives traveling around the world? His young audience responded to this speech with a petition signed by 1,000 students willing to serve abroad. 
That's a lot because that's a big commitment. And from one school, right? Uh 1,000 students? Yeah. Senator Kennedy's challenge to these students to live and work in developing countries around the world, to dedicate themselves to the cause of peace and development, inspired the beginning of the Peace Corps. Which is crazy. I didn't know that he basically started it before he was even president. Mm -hmm. Just two weeks later, in his November 2nd, 1960 speech at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, Kennedy proposed a Peace Corps of talented men and women who would dedicate themselves to the progress and peace of developing countries. Encouraged by more than 25,000 letters responding to this call, Kennedy took immediate action as president to make the campaign promise a reality. Which I think is also cool and speaks a lot to the Kennedy mentality that his first act as president is for the entire world, Mm -hmm. not the U.S. That was very specific to Jack as well, not just the Kennedys, but Jack was always very interested in world affairs and during school, instead of actually opening his textbooks, he was listening to Winston Churchill and basically just listening to current events on the radio Mm -hmm. all the time. This was very true to Jack. The Peace Corps program was an outgrowth of the Cold War. President Kennedy pointed out that the Soviet Union had hundreds of men and women scientists, physicists, teachers, engineers, doctors, and nurses prepared to spend their lives abroad in the service of world communism. The United States had no such program, and Kennedy wanted to involve Americans more actively in the cause of global democracy, peace, development, and freedom. Present-day Tanzania and Ghana were the first countries to participate in the program. President Kennedy welcomed the inaugural group of volunteers at the White House on August 28, 1961, to give them a personal farewell before their departure to Africa. Which, can you imagine being a part of that group? How freaking cool. Culturally, volunteers work to build trust within their communities and share their skills to solve challenges that face developing communities. The Peace Corps was actually not supposed to be a diplomatic, propaganda-based action in Jack's mind. It wasn't political. It was created to give opportunity, quote, for our people to express more fully their responsibilities in the great common cause of world development. To influence it. They were given only enough money to maintain their basic needs and health, and they set out to change the world. Why does this kind of remind me of Kick talking about the British girls and how Americans are like the best thing ever. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, Americans have a responsibility to do something because we're amazing. (laughs) Pretty much. That was the Kennedy mantra. 71% of American citizens initially approved of the program. And the Peace Corps is still to this day one of the lasting legacies of President John F. Kennedy. Since the inception of the Peace Corps, Some 200,000 volunteers have served in 139 countries. And guess who headed it up? Sarge Shriver, Eunice's husband. As soon as Jack appointed him, Sarge got to work articulating what their mission would be. Sarge worked very closely with Jack throughout his presidency. Remember, he is the one who nudged him in the right direction about calling Karata when MLK was in prison. But, wow, was Sarge overlooked by the Kennedy family. Mm. It was just how it was, it seems. The in-laws were part of the family, but not really. They weren't Kennedys. No one but Ethel, at least. Quote, Sarge was barely tolerated in the inner circle of the 1960 campaign. Even in Eunice's eyes, Her brother's career came before anything and everything else, including her husband's career. Sarge had been expected to run for the Democratic candidate for governor of Illinois, but on account of there couldn't be two members of the same family running for offices in the same state, Sarge stepped aside. Jack was civil with Sarge. Bobby didn't even offer him that. Quote, Bobby always spat on Sarge remembered Charles Peter, who worked with Bobby during Jack's 1960 campaign. His people considered Sarge weak, a non-player. Before I got to know him, I thought he was a jerk, and I wasn't alone. That was what he had bought into by marrying Eunice. But there was one Kennedy member who did see Sarge's value in the family. Kick. Wait, what? Back in 1935, Kick was 15 
Eunice was 14, and Kick discussed Sarge extensively with Eunice. Not as a potential for herself, but for Eunice. Oh my gosh. Isn't that insane? That was such a sweet surprise when I read that. Kick knew her sister that well. Of course, Kick was always more concerned with Eunice's marital future than (laughs) Eunice was. Quote, He sounded almost too perfect, as if he had been groomed to marry a Kennedy woman. He was brought up a fervent Catholic, played baseball well enough at Yale to think about a professional career as a second baseman, and while Jack was on his PT boat, Sarge was aboard submarines and destroyers. Wow. By the time Sarge first really met Eunice, he was assistant to the editor at Newsweek, but was unsatisfied and looking to become, quote, the right-hand man to a prominent businessman. You know, learn the ropes. He shared this aspiration with his close friend, Peter Hoggett, who immediately thought of Joe Kennedy, as his sister had gone to Norton with Kick. In fact, he was having dinner with Kick and Eunice in a few days at the St. Regis Hotel, and their dad would actually be staying there as well. That evening, Sarge just happened to drop by the St. Regis with a date on his arm. Quote, My goodness, there he is, the most divine man over there. (laughs) Kick whispered to her sister. He's just right for you. He was bubbling, bursting with energy, and very attractive. Eunice remembered. Mm. Okay, and about how old are they here? Because you said earlier they were 13 and 14? 15 and 14. So by this point, Kick was 27, Eunice was 26, and Sarge was 32. So I think that whenever Kick was talking about him, he was like an adult. Yeah. (laughs) When she's 14. He would have been 20. 20. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. But they didn't date or anything. Obviously. You just didn't know him at all. She's a kid. She's like, I don't freaking care what you're talking about. She's just listening to Kit go on and on and on. And then. About this perfect divine boy. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then um, how many years later? Like that was 15. Now she's 12. So yeah, like 12 years later. Finally, Eunice is like, okay, he was. What did she say? Bubbling, bursting with energy, and very attractive. Oh, took her 12 years to get there. Uh, Mm -hmm. Eunice is a little bit of a late bloomer. Took her until she was 26, but then she started looking around. How cute. And you just said Kick was 27, so she's about... Mm -hmm. This is 1947, and she died in 1948. Mm -hmm. Peter Hoggett introduced him as, quote, a fellow who would like to work for your father. Kick took him over, Joe Sr. looked him over, and set up a breakfast date a few days later. Joe Sr. asked Sarge to look over some of Joe Jr.'s letters from the war for possible publication. Sarge read through them and then kindly but honestly told Joe that they weren't really worthy of publication. Joe immediately offered him a job. (laughs) Wow. And the rest is history. It was kind of like a test. I I guess. I mean, the timeline seems like that because it's somebody who you are very really intimidated by. And then it's his beloved son who passed away in the war, the war that you fought in. So it's just a very personal kind of thing. And was he going to mix like business exactly. and personal? That's so interesting. I love Such that. Such a good setup. He's like, hmm, let's see what happens. He passed the test. He could count on him. Sarge and Eunice courted for seven years before marrying in 1953, just before Jack and Jackie's wedding. And together as a team, they took on injustice every day. Oh, so wait, how old is Eunice now? 26 plus seven years? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, so Eunice Eunice is 33 now, and then Sarge would be 39. And I wonder if they, they probably started dating just before she lost kick. Yeah. Sarge had only briefly been working for her father before Joe Sr. asked him to move to Washington, D.C. to help Eunice in organizing her office. (laughs) <laughs> He's like, Ahem. I think this partnership had more Kennedys behind it than just Kick. <laughs> Walter Ritter, Sarge's roommate at the time, said that he could tell Sarge was, quote unquote, smitten. Quote, I used to say that I'm the only guy I know who went and courted a woman at a federal penitentiary. Sarge remembered because at the time, Eunice was spending her days and evenings with women prisoners. Quote, Miss Kennedy, you talk tougher than me, remarked one of the women. I didn't know quite what I was doing at the beginning, Eunice recalled of this era. 
but the prisoners were wonderful. Oh, what a freaking force. This is in the 50s. Mm Mm-hmm. She's Nobody a, was doing this. No. And she's from a very affluent family. So it's not uh-huh. like this was her background. This is her upbringing. Right. She's like circling back to help. No. Mm-hmm. No. She is like a fish out of water in this situation and totally comfortable being yep. a fish out of water. Exactly. Keep listening. It's the same old story you always get in life. I see that people are so much smarter than people think they are. Jack thought Sarge was like a lost puppy following Eunice around and answering her insomnia-driven phone calls at 3 a.m. Okay, and remember Mary Lou, the cousin who spent all of her summers at Hyannisport growing up? How could I ever forget? I was just devastated. I had never seen all the children in mass like that, and I wanted to go home. That's the one. Well, she worked for Joe Sr., helping manage Merchandise Mart in Chicago alongside Sarge. Wow, I had never thought about Rose and Joe giving all of the cousins jobs as well, but that makes so much sense. We're going to get to do a mini-sode of just a compilation of all of Mary Lou's stories because there were so many that I could not fit into the script. I, I crammed as many of them as I could into episode 13, but there are still like three times that many. And so, good ones too. And good one. My favorite story about Jack ever is in that pile of stories that I've got. So we're going to be doing a mini-sode and that is actually already up on Patreon for you to go listen. So three years before Eunice and Sarge got married, in 1950, Eunice moved to Chicago to help. And Mary Lou remembers Eunice grilling her. For Mary Lou had just gotten married and Eunice wanted to know all about it. Mary Lou was a bit irritated with the Kennedys at the time because Joe Sr., like he did with Pat and all of his children, had her husband investigated by private detectives and got an FBI report on him before they got married. On Mary Lou's husband. Yep. Just to make sure. Oh, I am shocked by that. They literally treated them like their own kids, even as adults. They cared. As they grew up. He's making sure that she's not getting into a bad relationship. That's intense. Hence her being a little annoyed. (laughs) Eunice then asked Mary Lou. Do you like him? Mary Lou was like, these Kennedys are just so much. She said, (laughs) are you out of your mind? I mean, are you in love? Eunice insisted. I more than like him or I wouldn't have married him. Answered Mary Lou. (laughs) Eunice said, I do like marriage. It's very different. As if she were talking about an exotic dish. (laughs) Then Mary Lou understood. There's someone on the horizon. She said. Oh, well, maybe. Eunice responded. And remember, Mary Lou is an only child. So she was not used to people being so nosy. Uh When you grew up with eight other siblings, you're like, there's no privacy. (laughs) (laughs) Eunice and Sarge had five children from 1955 to 1965 and taught them each how to love people and stand up for them. And if you remember from Rosemary's episodes, because we did talk a lot about Eunice in the end of Rosemary's story, one of her children goes on to take over the Special Olympics. One of them builds a room for Rosemary, like specifically for Rosemary in his home. To come visit. For her to come stay with him. And then another of her kids starts Best Buddies. And Kick knew the whole time he was perfect for her sister. Mm. I can't imagine how much that would have meant to Eunice and helped her feel close to her sister Mm -hmm. for her whole life, pretty much. That my sister knew me that well, and I really am living the life that she wanted for me and how right Kick was, you know? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, for sure. Especially with the end of Kick's story, it like casts a more positive light. Mm -hmm. You know? On her sister's legacy, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Though Sarge, like his future father-in-law, thought the United States should stay out of World War II, like Joe Jr., he volunteered for service before Pearl Harbor was even attacked. He said that he felt he had a duty to serve his country, even if he disagreed with its policies. He spent five years on active duty and was awarded a Purple Heart for wounds he received during the infamous Battle of Guadalcanal. He was the most Catholic alongside his wife and Bobby and Rose. (laughs) He attended daily mass and had a rosary of well-worn wooden beads on his person at all times. 
Along with advocacy for special needs, he was outspoken against abortion and was a signatory on, quote, a new compact of care, caring about women, caring for the unborn. In true Kennedy fashion, Sarge was admitted to practice law in the District of Columbia, Illinois, New York, and at the U.S. Supreme Court. Just after marrying Eunice, he served as director of the Catholic Interracial Council, a group created to advocate for desegregation in Chicago schools, which at the time was the second largest school district in the United States. So that was obviously going to have a lot of influence on the rest of the United States. Yeah, huge impact. Sarge founded many programs to fight poverty and help people, including Head Start, Vista, Job Corps, Community Action, Upward Bound, Foster Grandparents, Legal Services, the Shriver Center, Indian and Migrant Opportunities, and Neighborhood Health Services, in addition to directing the Peace Corps, and in 1984 was elected President of the Special Olympics by the Board of Directors, which was founded in 1968 by his wife, Eunice. Wow. Sarge and Eunice Shriver were married for 56 years until Eunice's death temporarily separated them. So, the Peace Corps. That was good. But overall, Jack's first year of presidency was terrible. Oh, no. Guess what else happened just a few months into Jack and Bobby being responsible for the entirety of the U.S. and its citizens? They almost got us all nuked. First, you have to understand the heated battle between communism and democracy, the East and the West. This is the story of the Bay of Pigs. JFK had just watched Nikita Khrushchev put the first manned flight into space. And of course, they gloated. And of course, it infuriated Jack. April 17, 1961. 1,400 Cuban exiles launched what became a botched invasion at the Bay of Pigs on the south coast of Cuba. JFK Library. In 1959, Fidel Castro came into power in an armed revolt that overthrew Cuban dictator Batista, who had had a good relationship with the U.S. Naturally, the U.S. government distrusted Castro, a leader who took over by force and violence, and side-eyed his relationship with Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union. So, 1960 rolls around. JFK wins the presidential election and is briefed before his inauguration in January 1961 on a plan that the CIA had developed during the Eisenhower administration. They were going to train Cuban exiles, those who had fled from the country when Castro took over, many of whom were now living in Florida, for an insider invasion of their own homeland. They were counting on Cuban people and parts of the Cuban military supporting and aiding the invasion. The ultimate goal was to overthrow Castro and reestablish a non-communist government that would be friendly to the United States and to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, in 1960, the CIA had set up covert training camps in Guatemala, and by November, right when JFK was winning the election, the operation had trained a small army for an assault landing and guerrilla warfare to take Castro. The U.S. government obviously wanted to keep the invasion plans under wraps, but it had become pretty much common knowledge among the Cuban exiles in Miami, and of course, through his own spies, Castro quickly found out about the guerrilla training camps as early as October 1960, so that's a month before Jack gets elected. Then, JFK gets inaugurated in January, in the middle of this, and a month later, in February 1961, newly crowned President Kennedy authorized the invasion plan. Even though knowledge of the training camps had been leaked, Jack was determined to disguise U.S. involvement. He wanted to protect Americans by making it seem like it was just a civil revolution. Cubans wanted their democracy back, corrupted as it may have been. Plausible enough? But Kennedy overplayed his hand. The location of the invasion, the landing point, was the Bay of Pigs. This choice was a last-minute audible by one John F. Kennedy. 
to try and really sell this lie that the U.S. was not involved. The Bay of Pigs was one of Castro's favorite vacation spots, but it's a remote little inlet that's surrounded by swamp on the southern coast of Cuba. Jack thought that there would be little resistance to have to contend with, and that would help hide any U.S. involvement. Maybe he was thinking less soldiers means a more believable story that it was just a Cuban coup. Unfortunately, the landing site would also leave the troops more than 80 miles from the refuge in Cuba's mountains. If anything went wrong, they couldn't get out. The original invasion plan was going to be two airstrikes against the Cuban airbases. A 1,400-man troop would storm the shore under the cover of darkness and launch a surprise attack. Paratroopers would have dropped in advance, and at the same time, a smaller troop would land on another coast to create confusion. The success of the plan depended on the Cuban population joining the invaders. So the first error happened on April 15, 1961, when eight bombers left Nicaragua to bomb Cuban airfields. The CIA had used retired World War II B-26 bombers and painted them to look like Cuban Air Force planes. As they flew in from Nicaragua where they were stationed, the bombers missed a bunch of their targets and left most of Castro's Air Force perfectly untouched and operable. Secrecy was no longer. They just dropped literal bombs from the sky and Cuba wasn't impaired really at all like they expected them to be at this point. They dropped bombs onto concrete and grass. Basically, they went in and told the Cubans, hey, the attack starts right now. (laughs) Get ready. Not only that, but photos of the repainted U.S. planes leaked to the media. And apparently the CIA isn't too great at arts and crafts because the American involvement in the invasion was quite obvious. President Kennedy canceled the second airstrike. Freaking embarrassing. (laughs) On April 17th, so two days later, the main Cuban exile invasion force known as Brigade 2506 landed at beaches along the Bay of Pigs and immediately they were met with heavy fire because they were expecting them. The unharmed Cuban planes that were supposed to be disarmed attacked them from above and it was raining. So the foot soldiers had wet, soggy equipment and also didn't have enough ammo. The exiles landed in small boats at the Bay of Pigs, which is a very remote part of Cuba, not near any town at all. The Cuban authorities had heard about the invasion and they were able to surround this exile force very quickly, isolate them and begin to massacre them, kill them and capture them. And that put the president in a very difficult position. He either had to commit U.S. forces to rescue this abortive invasion force, or he had to deny all connection with it. Writer Michael Dobbs. Over the next 24 hours, Castro ordered roughly 20,000 troops to the beach, and the Cuban Air Force remained in control of the sky. As the situation grew increasingly grim, President Kennedy authorized an air umbrella at dawn on April 19th six unmarked American fighter planes took off to help defend the Cuban exiles. But the planes arrived an hour late, confused by the change in time zones between Nicaragua and Cuba. They were shot down by the Cubans. Some revolutionary soldiers escaped to the sea, but the rest were killed or taken captive and imprisoned by Castro's men. Almost 1,200 members of Brigade 2506 surrendered to Castro, and more than 100 men were killed. Not good. Not a good look for the new U.S. president. The CIA and military begged him to send American troops in, but he wouldn't. Castro bragged and puffed up his victory. Khrushchev laughed and shook his finger at Kennedy. Jackie said that for those three days, Jack didn't stop crying and only left his room when he had to. He was distraught. It humbled him. It made him skeptical of experts. How could I be so stupid? How could I listen to those people? But here was the lesson that Jack learned. You are the president. You may have experts who can help inform you, but they are not the end. 
They don't make the decisions, Jack. You do. Never again will you sign off on someone else's assessment. Never again will you trust blindly those sent to help you. You are the president. You see, this was Jack's mistake. He let military leaders and CIA tell him what should be done, and he gave them the go-ahead. He didn't know. He didn't know that that wasn't good enough. He didn't know the right questions to ask. He had almost all young people around him, and Jack didn't realize that the people who knew the right answers, the right questions to ask, didn't care to speak up because, at the end of the day, it wouldn't be their problem. Historian Evan Thomas explained that Eisenhower should have warned him, but he didn't. When the torch was passed, they should have had longer, detailed conversations about what was going on, who was who, but they didn't. This was a CIA operation primarily, and Jack went into it under slightly foggy pretenses. There was a man named Richard Bissell who ran covert operations at the CIA. And Richard Bissell was very ambitious. Richard Bissell reminds me of the quote-unquote friend at the end of the Ringling Brothers story who um, was also very ambitious, if you remember that. So Bissell head of covert operations, very aggressive, and had a deep desire to become the head of the CIA. He wanted to go all out in Cuba because he felt that if he could pull that off, it would be evidence for his personal, I should be promoted to the head of the CIA case. Bissell sold to Jack that with the invasion of Cuba, they were going to get rid of Castro. But he was also selling his world, the world of covert action he evangelized to JFK that by subterfuge, this method of secret manipulation and spies and deceit, all of the things that you see glamorized in movies, the United States could solve all of its problems. And the Kennedys fell for Dick Bissell. Quote, Kennedy had a real respect for the people in the intelligence agency, and he made the obvious assumption that they knew what they were doing. Richard Reeves. They didn't. Bethany. (laughs) They told him that if they went in, the Cubans would rush behind them and it wouldn't upset Khrushchev at all because it would just look like the U.S. was helping the Cubans, sure, but ultimately it was the Cubans fighting for the Cubans. The military signed off on it because in their minds, it was a CIA operation. So they weren't responsible. If it failed, it wasn't their problem. So why speak up and spend time arguing or offering up what they know of military operations? Jack wasn't aware that these high-up people would really be like that. He truly wanted good for people. He truly wanted to help and come up with the best possible solution and assumed that they did too. He didn't know that he couldn't just allow experts to be experts. For they do not lay awake at night, haunted by the men that were lost. They do not carry the crown, and they do not carry the burden. Only Jack did. Well, Jack and Bobby. Jack has literal images of men being shot down in the Pacific. All the talk about billions of dollars and millions of soldiers made thousands of dead sound like drops in the bucket. But if those thousands want to live as much as the ten I saw on my boat, they should measure their words with great, great care. One of those men, one day, was their brother. Here's what was happening behind the closed doors of the White House those three days in April 1961. This is an interview with author David Nassau from the Kennedy Library Archives. He was writing a biography on Joe Sr. when he interviewed Eunice, Jean, and Teddy and learned this story. This is David Nassau on Joe Sr. He spent a lot of time writing, and he spent a lot of time dictating because he wrote so much. And you can tell when he wants to say something personal. He doesn't want his very loyal and trusted secretaries or stenographers to read it. He has a secretary everywhere, in retirement, everywhere he goes. But when he has something special to say, it's in his handwriting. And those are remarkable letters. When most of us write home, those of us who still write, we write one letter to the family. Dear wife and kids. He would write ten separate letters one to Rose, and nine to the kids. And in each of those letters to the kids, 
they would be personalized because he would know what those kids needed to hear. He knew that Eunice was too serious and worked too hard, needed to spend more time sailing and fooling around, that Jack was too sloppy and didn't take anything very seriously, that Joe sometimes took things too seriously. He knew their teachers. He knew their best friends. He knew their habits. There's something absolutely remarkable about it. When I first interviewed the children, and in the beginning, there were three children alive, and I talked to Eunice, and I talked to Jean, and I talked to Ted. They would all go on and on about their father. And in the beginning, I thought, this is the family line they're feeding me. Nobody can respect, admire, and adore their father in this way. But it was true, because he always lifted them up. He was a Cassandra. He thought the world was falling apart until he talked to his kids. I'll just tell you one story. Jacqueline told Schlesinger that after the Bay of Pigs, she found her husband crying, sobbing, and nothing could cheer him up. Nothing. At one point, Bobby, the attorney general, says to Jack, the president, they're in the Oval Office. Let's call Dad. He'll make us feel better. So they pick up the phone, and they call Palm Beach, and Kennedy answers the phone. The patriarch answers the phone, and he says, boys, you did just fine. You did the right thing. And he says to Jack, and you especially for taking responsibility for this disaster. That was the absolute right thing to do. The American people will forgive you for that. They will absolutely forgive you for that. Then he says, and I can almost imagine it with a little bit of a chuckle. If you're going to have a debacle like this one, it's best to have it early. And Bobby was right. They hung up the phone and they felt better. And it wasn't just cheerleading. He was right. Jack's poll numbers went up. And within a year, the Bay of Pigs was on the back burner. Until we bring it up. (laughs) (laughs) Credited to a newspaper man by PBS, quote, Jack displayed a wisdom and sympathy of a man twice his years. But Jack still had to worry about Castro and Khrushchev. After the meeting in which the military showed Jack the nuclear war plan to kill 175 million people in the case that they needed it, he was shaken. He's quoted saying somberly, And we call ourselves the human race. Nothing terrified him more than having to push that button. They were at the helm during the most turbulent moment in American history. The rumors are legion, some sincere, some slander. They gave everything to their country. But what did it look like behind closed doors, in their homes, the most intimate moments of their time on Earth? Sometimes the truth is more wild than the headlines. They seemed to live the easy life, but they lost it all in an instant. They ran faster, worked harder, burned brighter, and then they were gone. You have just listened to The Kennedy Siblings, episode 15 from Blood and Business. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind the scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business. The main sources for this episode were Bobby Kennedy by Chris Matthews, The Kennedy Women by Lawrence Lemer, An Unfinished Life, John F. Kennedy by Robert Dalek. To see a complete list of sources for all Blood and Business episodes, head on over to Patreon for a free PDF download. 